Well, a lot of announcements today, a lot of things that we don't usually do, but let's jump right in to the Word. If you have a Bible, you want to open up to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We are going right through the Scriptures here in about three weeks, probably the beginning of January, we'll be starting in the book of 1 Timothy. And... Um, this, this book of 2 Thessalonians is, is a pretty tough little book to teach through because it has, like we saw at the chapter 2, a statement about the Antichrist and, and about the tribulation period. And you say, oh, you know, what's that mean? And there, there's sort of pieces of the puzzle that you have to put together, but the instructions are quite lengthy, <laughs> You've got to read the whole book of Daniel. You've got to read the book of Revelation. You've got to know verses out of Zechariah and Ezekiel and Isaiah. And, and you have to look at all of these things and expound on them to understand one verse out of 2 Thessalonians. And we did it. We went through it and not exhaustively, um, even though it was exhausting, um, it wasn't exhaustively. There's still a lot of stones yet to be unturned on that topic. I know the ladies are actually going through the book of Revelation on Thursdays right now. And, um, and so it's, it's an exciting time to, to look at these end times. Well, as Paul had been talking about that, they, they had had other teachers come in, people that supposedly had letters from Paul himself. People said they talked to Paul and that the information on this had changed and that the rapture had already came, they missed it, and that they're in the tribulation period because the Thessalonians, the day that Paul preached the gospel, they had been persecuted in Thessalonica for their faith for several years. And it's just getting worse and worse, trying to stand as a Christian as they're being persecuted horribly in Thessalonica. And so they thought, maybe we really are in the tribulation period. It does seem like it to us. And, um, and so Paul here says, no way, you're not in the tribulation period. Absolutely not. The rapture did not happen. You're not going to see uh, this. He thought he explained it pretty well in 1 Thessalonians. He covered the same issues, but yet people had twisted it. And so he starts off, if you get a letter that's from me that changes what I taught you, I have not changed my teaching, nor will I uh, in the future. You need to hang in there. So now he prays for people of the last day. So if you say, man, how do I pray for people who are in the last days? We, how do you pray for yourself and each other? Well, this is it. Verse 13 through 17, as we finish up chapter two today. But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through the sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth, to which he called you by our gospel, for the attaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or by our epistle. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father, who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. So the, the flow here is in contrast to what he just taught on. Remember, he just taught on that in these last days, as we're heading towards the time when the Antichrist will be revealed, that evil is going to permeate the earth. Doctrines of demons are going to persuade many, even People that have been in solid Christian churches are now wanting their ears tickled. They don't want to listen to the truth. They want to listen to, it says they heap up teachers that tell them what they want to hear rather than what the truth is and what they need to hear. And these people here, he says, eventually you'll be in the tribulation period. And these people, we just read in, in verses 10 through 12, that they will perish because they would not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. To receive that God loves you. To receive that he sent his son to die for your sins. What sins? I'm a good person. I don't need anybody to die for my sins. 
Well, you need to confess that you are a sinner or God can't help you. The truth can't be in you. Because God's truth is that you are a sinner, a horrible sinner, and that's why Jesus died a horrible, torturous death. About the most cruel way a person can die, being beaten. It tells us in Isaiah 2 that he no longer looked human. His face was so bloated and bloodied, and he was so beaten. And this again, because our sins are so great. But yet they don't want to listen to the love of the truth, that God loves you. This is why he is the Lamb of God, to take away the sin of the world. Well, I'm a good person, and I don't like the fact that you're calling me a sinner. And it says, because they would not believe the truth, they will be condemned. Because they have not believed the love of the truth. What is the truth? God loves you. What is the truth? That we're all sinners. Not not one of us is an exempt. We've all fallen short of the glory of God, but the gift of God. So in contrast, you have believed the love of the truth. And because you believe the love of the truth, he's talking here in this prayer, you are in contrast. You need to understand there's no way you could end up in the tribulation period. You will not perish. You will not be condemned. You are not appointed to wrath, but salvation. He covered these things in earlier passages in 1 Thessalonians, as well as in other places. There's no condemnation to those in Christ. God so loves the world, he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him, what's the very first thing on the list? Shall not perish. It's it's ridiculous that you would think that after believing in Christ that you would perish that after Jesus becoming your friend your savior your lord that now he would condemn his own child that he would condemn his own bride no he loves his bride he washes her he cleanses her without spot, without wrinkle, without blemish. He's going to present us, the church, before the Father, perfect in righteousness. Our own righteousness? No. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we would become the righteousness of Christ. So God looking at us right now doesn't focus on the outward man as we do. He focuses on the heart. And your heart has the Holy Spirit living in you. He has circumcised that old sin nature and it's gone. Romans 2 tells us. And the Holy Spirit living in you now is a seal, a down payment that you are God's possession. And all of God's possessions will be raptured and taken to be with him. So in essence, he he says here in this prayer, so guys, keep on keeping on. Be confident with joy that in this world, yes, there's many tribulations, but you are not in the tribulation. Well, let's look at verse 13 in particular here. But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren. 2 Thessalonians 2.13. But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, Because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. So Paul, once again, as he has said a few times, at the end of each chapter in 2 Thessalonians, he prays. And he's going to say, we are bound. We, We must. We are compelled. We cannot not thank God for you. I think they were thinking, God's putting up with us. God's stuck with us. If God could, he would go, "Mm, I don't know if saving those guys was such a good idea to begin with. Often as Christians, this is the way we think. Our flesh condemns us. The world condemns us. Satan condemns us. We have more pounding on second-by-second basis of of getting us to look at things in the natural rather than through the eyes of God. 
And the whole Bible is constantly saying, get your eyes on the Lord. See the world through his perspective. So we as believers need to come boldly into that throne room of grace. Because we're as kids. We don't come sheepishly. We don't come going, oh, I'm such a loser. I'm such a sinner. Who am I to even talk to God? No, this is demonic. We come by faith, not by sight. And by faith we come. And, and just as Paul is speaking, it's the Holy Spirit writing. God gives thanks for us. Do you, do you guys who have children rejoice in your children? Do you, you're, are you like, oh, thank God for my children? Well, you are God's child. You may be rebellious at times. We may want to brain you at times. Maybe we ought to straighten you out at times. But you are our children, our children, our life, our love. Same way, Paul's saying, I give thanks for you. And then notice the term he uses. Beloved brethren by the Lord. Do we understand that we are God's beloved? Now he's going to say in just a minute, he loves us. But I think the term beloved has a different connotation, doesn't it? It almost has a sense of, of romance. A sense of, you know, I love you, but this is beloved means means oh, I want to hug you and hold you and not let you go. It's, it's always funny you see those memes, you know. Have you seen this where the mother is hugging her eight-year-old child and then the next meme is she's trying to hug her 13-year-old child and they're like, ah, get away from me, shut the door, get, leave me alone. And, and the mother's trying to hug the child and they won't hug her back. And then finally they... She hugs them and they're stiff, like, okay, hug me, mom. Get over there. Stop now. Done. But beloved means, oh, they're hugging you. And then they, they come out of that teenage thing and they get in their 20s again and, and then they hug you again. My daughter's amazing. She always hugs me and she won't let me go. And so I've learned to quit trying to let her go. I just hug her and hug her. And... Beloved. You are not just loved by God, but you are beloved of the Lord. There's a book of the Bible on the romance of King Solomon with his bride. But the whole thing is really a picture of Christ and the church. And let me point out a couple of Psalms where the king is beloved to his wife. He says in Song of Solomon 2.4, he brought me to the banqueting house. His banner over me, it was love. Song of Solomon 2.10, my beloved spoke and said to me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. In Song of Solomon 3, 4, now is the response of the bride to her husband. Scarcely had I passed by when I found the one I love. I held him, and I would not let him go. She's sort of on her honeymoon period, and she rolls over, and her husband's out in the fields and talking to the workers and so forth. And, and she's like, ah, I don't want breakfast. I, don't, I just want him. And then she finally finds him and she grabs him and brings, her, brings him back to the bedchamber and won't let him go. Zechariah, Zephani, Zephani, I think, really speaks of the heart of God in chapter 3, verse 17. The Lord your God in the midst of the mighty one will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you in his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. I'll tell you what, that verse right there got me through some very difficult teenage years. When I would feel like, oh, God's up there hating on me, disappointed in me. I'm so unworthy. Am I even saved? And then this verse would come back to mind. No, no, no. The Lord is smiling. He's over you with rejoicing. He's standing over singing about his love and how precious you are 
to him. Yes, God loves us. We're going to cover that in a minute. But he, you are beloved of the Lord. And then because from the beginning you chose you for salvation. Now, I hate to do this to you in such an encouraging, inspirational message. But this verse 13 is a proof text to a very bad doctrine of Calvinism. And the way they read this verse is because God, before the foundations of the world, unconditionally elected you or predestined you, that use that word in the same interchangeable, which is not, shouldn't be. He has predestined you, elected you for salvation. Unlike those he chose, elected, predestined, to be damned in hell, this is what he says, from the beginning, means from the beginning of time. He chose you, he elected you, uh, not of your own will, but he did this before the foundations of the world. This is ridiculous. None of these words are found in the New Testament, meaning what the Calvinists say they mean, only in the writings of Calvin and those other people. For example, this term, from the beginning, R.K., it's used 58 times in 56 verses, and never does it mean before the beginning of time. Matter of fact, it almost always refers to present past. For example, Paul says to almost all the churches, like in Philippians 4.15, from the beginning of the gospel when I was with you and departed from Macedonia. So he's saying from the beginning when I came and I preached the gospel and you heard about Jesus for the first time. The furthest I found that it goes back is in Matthew 19 when Jesus says, talking about divorce and remarriage, he says from the beginning, referring to the sixth day of creation, God made them male and female. Never does it go before creation. The furthest it goes back that I found in those 56, 58 times, was back to the sixth day of creation. But yet, this is one of those terms that triggers the Calvinists to say, before the beginning of time, God decided who was going to hell and who was going to heaven. End of story. This is the way God is. I heard of that doctrine early on in my 20s, and my very first thought was, that's not Christianity, that's the Muslim religion. It's the will of Allah, you go to hell. It's the will of Allah, you go to heaven. It's the will of Allah that you prayed that prayer. It's the will of Allah that you sinned. It's the will of Allah that you didn't sin. It's, it's, and it takes the free will of man completely out of the equation. Calvinism actually teaches this, that we are so depraved that we can't even feel sorry for our own sins. It's like, hold it, didn't God give us a conscience for that? Didn't, didn't he make us spiritual beings for that? Didn't the Holy Spirit's in the world convicting men of sin and righteous judgment? No, cannot happen. We are so depraved, God actually has to have the Holy Spirit come into our hearts, cause us to be born again. And then you believe because God caused you to believe by his Holy Spirit being in your life. The choice of man's completely out of it. So these are trigger words that do not mean what they say they mean in the scriptures. And then the next word they see is the word chosen. Every time they see the word chosen, they say, oh, that's the, that's the doctrine of election. What Paul is talking about here is that they chose to believe in Jesus. But yet in the Calvinist mind, no, that means they were chosen before time by God and they were the elect. You see, the, the Calvinists want you to put on their glasses so when it says, God so loves the world, no, no, that's not true. God loves those he's elected. When it says that Christ died for all, no, 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 he didn't die for all. He died for those who are the elected before the foundation of the world. Now, this particular word chosen, it's the word hareo, and it's only used three times in the New Testament. It's used here. Then it's used in Philippians 1.22, where Paul is saying, the Lord's given me the choice to go be with him right now, or 
to stay on earth and be fruitful and help you guys out. I choose to stay. It's it. It wasn't talking about salvation at all. It was just Paul's choice to stay and be with the church rather than to go to heaven at this moment. And then in Hebrews eleven twenty five, 25, when Moses chose to rather suffer with God's people than to um, stay in Egypt and all the pleasures of Egypt. So they, they have th- these trigger words from the beginning. They have this trigger word, chose. They have this trigger word. The next one is salvation. Here it's the word soteria, but it's also the word sozo. Now, some of you guys are here going, what did I sign up for here today? I, I understand. That's why I apologize. I got to take a moment here because this is a major proof text for some very bad doctrine. And I want to undo that because it's, it's very hurtful in our walk with the Lord, believing we don't have full choice every day. We do. And it's important. That's how we love God is out of that free choice. God's not programming anybody ahead of time for anything. But this word, either soteria or tsotso, it's it talks about all kinds of things. It doesn't, it's not always referring to salvation and eternal salvation. It's not. But in the Calvinist mind, it always does. No, sometimes it's just referring to uh, a healthy doctrine or a healthy lifestyle, or it's talking about sanctification or even glorification. It's talking about being saved from the attack of the enemies. It's being saved from bad doctrine. For example, in 1 Timothy 4.16, Paul says, take heed to your doctrine and to yourself, the way you're living, Timothy. Continue in them. You'll save both yourself and those who hear you. Now, he wasn't saying to Timothy that as you preach good doctrine, you're saving yourself and you're in the process of saving the church. No. For eternal salvation, this is, again, the way the Calvinist wants you to look at it. No, he's simply saying you'll be saved from bad doctrine. If you teach good doctrine, the church will be saved from bad doctrine. Earlier in that same chapter of 1 Timothy 4, he said in the last days are going to be doctrines of demons. And many are going to depart from the faith. And now I believe he's referring back to that. Don't be afraid of even the doctrines of demons that come in the last days. Because you have made your church strong and healthy against the powerful demonic doctrines of the last day. And so again here, I think Paul is saying you're saved from the tribulation. That's the context. You're you're safe from the tribulation. You're not going to be in it. But then as we go on to verse 14, he's going to say, God has saved you to glorification. You're going to be glorified in heaven. But again, this bad, horrible doctrine of of the Calvinistic election, biblical election, not that this verse is talking about that, but just so you understand Everybody who believes in the gospel, everybody who says, yes, I am a sinner, I do believe in Jesus. At that point, they become elect. Just like the children of Israel were elect, we now are grafted in to the house of Abraham. So we become the spiritual adopted children of Abraham. And so because Israel was elect, and now we're grafted in to the lineage of Abraham. Abraham's our grandpa too. I understand we're adopted, but we have every right as a natural child. We are now also the New Testament church. And all those who believe in the Messiah have the faith of Abraham are now also a part of that combined elect of Israel and of Christ. And then also... Those who believe in Jesus are the elect. And from that point forward, we are predestined by God. God knows every hair upon your head. He knows every breath that you breathe. There's no weapons formed against you that will prosper. Everything that happens in your life, God will turn it around for good. 
Everybody who believes is elect, and God has predestined before time. If anything's predestined before time, I don't think it is before time. I think it's at creation. God predestined at creation that everybody who believes in him can be confident that God has us in his hand, and he's never going to let us go. And we have all who believe in Christ are predestined to be in heaven with the Lord. And our road between now and then, it's up and down, isn't it? It's a roller coaster. One week we're living a holy life. The next week we're struggling to live a holy life. One week we're a prayer warrior. The next week we have a hard time even praying for our mill. We, we, we are the things I don't want to do, I do. The things I do want to do, I don't do. Our sinful flesh is really sinful. Oh, wretched man that I am, Paul says. That's the apostle Paul. <laughs> he was struggling with his flesh. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of death? What's the answer? There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, our Lord. We're predestined. He'll never let us go. He's predestined us to be glorified with him in heaven. And this is exactly what Paul is referring to. So once again in verse 13, but we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, beloved brethren by the Lord, because God from the beginning, from when he preached the gospel to them, when he came to town, chose you for salvation. Everybody who believes in Jesus is the elect of God, is chosen through the sanctification by the spirit and belief in the truth. So how do we get to glorification? How do we make it out of this life? Two things that will strengthen us to live a holy life until we're with the Lord. The Holy Spirit and the word of God. Boy, that's revelation, isn't it? You've never heard this before. <laughs> God's spirit lives in you. He's never letting you go. He has sealed you. The gifts, the Holy Spirit coming into our life is a gift of God. And the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Jesus said, all who come into my hand, I will lose none. None will perish. John 10, but all of them I will raise up on the last day. John 6 says, of them I lose not one. All who come unto me, everything I just said about what I do, the Father does as well. You're in the Father's hand. It's the Father's will that everybody who believes in the Son has eternal life and will not perish. It's the Father's will that all who come unto the Son not only have eternal life, but God has you from that second forward. There's not a hair on your head that he doesn't know in number. There's not a breath you breathe that he has not counted. There's nothing that comes into your life that is a coincidence anymore. All things will be turned together for God's will, things of this earth or spiritual demonic attacks, whatever it is, God is working in it to continue his work in your life. So both of these things are a part of the sanctification process unto glorification, the spirit and the word of God. David said, I hide God's word in my heart that I don't sin against him. God's word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. David said, blessed is everyone who meditates on God's word day and night. He says his leaf won't wither. He won't stumble. And whatever he does prospers. Wow. Isn't that amazing? How can you outdo that? Well, then verse 14 here. To which he called you by the gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So once again, he's using this term. He called you through the gospel, by the gospel, through the gospel. You, how did you become a believer? The gospel was preached to you. Yesterday, we had a funeral service for a sweet brother that passed away unexpectedly here in our church, 60 years old, found out he had leukemia. They started him on chemo the next day, got COVID, died within a few days. Our dear brother, Larry King, 
63 years old, not, not quite, 62, almost December 1st on our women's banquet is his, his birthday. But man, I was, it was just such a sweet time yesterday, able to preach the gospel. So many eyes open for the first time to explain to them the simplicity of the gospel that Jesus came. He bore your sins upon the cross. They've all been paid for, past, present, future sins. And by not of yourself, not of your past self, not of your present self, not of a possible future self that you got to attain to, not of yourself, not of your works. It's great. Good works will get your reward in heaven, but good works are not a part of the formula to get you to heaven for eternal life. Not of yourself. Well, I've got to be a really good Christian to get to heaven, don't I? And I'm struggling with being a good Christian. Not of yourself. It's not of yourself. Living, God does not have good Christians and bad Christians. There are strong Christians and weak Christians. There are fruitful Christians and not so fruitful Christians. But all God's children are God's children, right? And you, the moment you say, Jesus, forgive my sins through the work of the cross, and I believe you conquered sin and death because you rose again on the third day, at that moment, you will not perish. This is through the gospel. It's good news. I had a few people afterwards tell me, going, man, I've never heard it like that. It's supposed to be good news. But yet, the way it's preached in, in most of the America today is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we expect you to see perfect attendance at church from now on. We're going to be counting how much money you give. You better get serious about prayer, and we better see some, you know, some proof on the knees, whether you've got skin knees or not, from praying this week. And I better see a Bible that's been marked up. And you should at least attempt to tell somebody about the Lord. You know, Jesus loves you, and then duck. You know, something should be out there. And we're going to be, you know, doing the checklist, whether I do it or God does it, it doesn't matter. These are the checklists uh, that, that have to also be done in lieu of believing. And so they really do say, believe on the Lord and have a bunch of good works. Believe on the Lord and you, on Sundays you, be, you better pretend you're holy. Look holy on Sunday at least. I can't tell you how many kids have walked away from the Lord because their parents on the way to the church. Don't tell everybody what we said last night. Don't, don't tell anybody that dad cussed me out. Don't tell anybody that I kicked the dog. Don't tell anybody. It. And the kids are like, ah, ah, I got to make sure I don't let anything slip, you know, and make my parents look bad. And then on the way home from church, they're back to cussing each other and kicking it. Yelling. It's, and it's just this hypocritical thing going to church. It's not a you can't really be yourself. You've got to be a pretend self. No, we can, we can be ourselves. We're, we're, we're saved, not of ourselves, not of our works. We're saved by believing in him. That's good news. It's good news. Well, am I going to make it to the end? God, the moment you believe through the gospel, the moment you believe, what does it say? God's pretesting that you're obtaining the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2 said, Paul said, all of us, right now, right this second, he's saying to the Ephesian church, are seated together with him in heavenly places. From God's eternal point of view, God to him, the past, present, and future can all be seen equally. He already sees us. Because the moment you believed, you're seated in heavenly places. Once you leave this body, you're absent from this body and present with the Lord. Paul said in Titus 2.13, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior. Paul is saying the same thing. So what is verse 13 and 14 saying? Let me, let me clarify here before we move on. You are not like those who did not receive and rejected the love of the truth. You're not like those people. They rejected God's love for them. They rejected the fact that they were sinners. They rejected the cross of Christ as the only way of salvation. Secondly, he's saying in verse 13 and 14, but you are not in the great tribulation and you're never gonna go through the great tribulation. Thirdly, 
Quite the opposite. The Holy Spirit and the Word are sanctifying you, strengthening you for many rewards in the life to come. And finally, through the work of the Spirit and the Word, God is going to bring you into the glory, not a substandard glory, but in the same glory as Jesus. The Father's going to look at the Son, go, there's perfect righteousness. He's going to look at you, there's perfect righteousness. Not because we attained it of ourselves or our works, but it's a part of the predestined plan of God that you are given that righteousness and the same glory as Jesus. Well, we're going to finish up here quickly now. In verse 15, not that you guys don't want it to go much longer, but I'm just saying this is the facts. You have to deal with it. 2 Thessalonians 2.15, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or by epistle. This word, stand fast, stand firm. Don't be moved. So guys, understand, you're all new believers there in Thessalonica. And you guys have had the first wave of many waves that are going to come through. Guys coming through saying, well, let me tell you, Paul said this, but let me tell you the truth. Well, I know the apostles teach this, but God revealed to me in a vision this. Oh, they say that you won't be in the tribulation, but I happen to know you'll at least be halfway in the tribulation or make it to the end of the tribulation. Don't, don't be persuaded. You guys got to stand fast. The doctrine I've given to you is unchangeable. It wasn't from me. It was from God. And these truths of God, like God, God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So is his word. So is his truths. So they're going to come along in our day and say, oh, by the way, we've thought the last, you know, 5,000 years of the Bible's existence that homosexuality was, was a sin, but guess what? We were wrong. <laughs> it's actually a wonderful thing. My two moms, my two dads. Now we've been teaching for the last 5,000 years that only, men, only women can have babies. I almost said men can have babies. Only men can have babies. No, the Bible didn't. But now, hey, let's be open and loving and not be narrow-minded. Men can have babies. It, it's, it's insanity how Christians are being moved, not on minute points, am I in the rapture or not, but moved on obvious, self-evident truths. You don't even need the Bible. But yet, the Bible does make these things clear. In the beginning, God made man and woman to be together, and the two of them become one flesh. So again here, we stand fast. Don't be moved in the future by what men may say, but hold the traditions. Now, typically, the Bible has been told us to not have traditions, that, but, but to have a relationship with Christ. So we've always seen like having traditions are sort of the thing that kills a vibrant relationship. And, and I would agree, the Bible does teach that. Matter of fact, remember when Jesus' disciples didn't do the ceremonial washing of their hands and they started eating. The Pharisees go, ah, they didn't do the ceremonial washing. Not that that's in the Bible, it's not. This is their tradition. But in Mark chapter 7, verse 7 through 9, Jesus says, in vain they, referring to those Pharisees that are trying to get them to keep traditions, worship me, teaching as doctrines of commandments of men, laying aside the commandment of God. You hold the traditions of men, the washing and the pitchers and the cups and many other such things you do. He said to them, all too well, you reject the commandments of God that you may keep your traditions. In Mark 7, 13, making the word of God no effect. Mark 7, 13, making the word of God of no effect through your tradition, which you have handed down and many such things you do. So he actually says here that not only are you adding stuff and then making it like God spoke that, but you're adding stuff that's actually contradicting God's word. And if they follow your tradition versus God's word, they actually are breaking God's word to keep your tradition. And you guys are fine with that. 
This is where it's negative. Paul says something similar to the church in Colossae. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to what? The traditions of men. According to the basic principles of the world. And not according to Christ. So that's the negative side of traditions. If men's philosophies are coming in or men's traditions that aren't the same as Jesus' nature, I, I, my, my proof text is this. Does it look like Jesus along the Sea of Galilee? <laughs> is what we're doing here similar to what Jesus did? They, they were upset that he didn't have religious clothing on. I don't, I'm dressed like all of you. He just simply spoke the word of God. He didn't preach a sermon and have highs and lows and made him cry and made him laugh. He just taught them the truth and hung out with them, ate with them, was with them and prayed for them. That's a very stark you know, contrast to have this religious clothing and having this grand poobah hat and certain jewelry and incense burning and, and all these traditions and no one to stand up and sit down and kneel and, and, and all of these traditions of burning candles and, and all of these things you're going, what's, now where does this come from? It, not in the Bible. None of it's in the Bible. Nowhere does it say to dress like this. Nowhere does it say to have incense. Nowhere does it say to burn candles. Nowhere all this stuff is traditions of men that made up over hundreds of years. Well, it can't be wrong. It's been going on for hundreds of years. There's a lot of lies that have been going on hundreds of years. But what were the traditions that Paul was referring to? First of all, in Colossians 4.16, he said, When this epistle is read among you, see that you read it also in the church. And he goes on to the various churches. In this case, Laodicea. What is a tradition? that we would read these epistles. Are we keeping the tradition of Paul? We sure are. In Acts 2.42, a tradition that the early apostles set up, that we would continue steadfastly, number one, in the apostles' doctrine. Are we doing that? We're doing it right now. Secondly, fellowship. That's talking to each other, sharing with each other, what's going on in your life, praying for each other. And then three, the breaking of bread. Now, I think that's talking about communion, but we eat donuts every week. <laughs> and a lot of spiritual stuff happens, drinking coffee and having donuts. But we do do communion uh, once a month. And, and uh, on occasion, on Wednesday nights, we have it available. It's beautiful. We should have that available this Wednesday while we have prayer and praise and pie. And then, the, and then in prayers, all kinds of prayers by yourself, couple people, the whole congregation, all kinds of prayers. These are the traditions that's been set up. Clark, in his commentary, said this, the, where, the word perdosia, which is perdosius, which is the word fellowship here, or the word tradition here, I mean, which we render tradition, signifies anything delivered to the way of teaching. Here most obviously means the doctrines delivered by the apostles to the Thessalonians, whether in preaching, private conversations, or in these letters. Another tradition Paul had, we find in 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, following my example as I follow the example of Christ. And then Philippians 3.17. Brother, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us as a pattern. These are the traditions that Paul has given us. And I would say there's many different branches of Christianity that have taken on the traditions of men and they're absolutely opposed to the simplicity that we have in Christ. And they're absolutely opposed to the simplicity of following Paul's example. Well, verse 16 now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace. Uh, people often wrestle with the triunity of God. We all do to some degree. 
But the Lord our God is one Lord. We have one God. But he is in three distinct persons. The Holy Spirit is writing the scriptures. The Holy Spirit is in us and with us. But we, when we get to heaven, we're going to see the one God, but we're going to see him in three persons. How to explain that? I don't know. The whole world. I know Francis Schaeffer, when he was comparing all religions of the world, as he looked at the world and said, as our, as our forefathers of our country said, according to the God of nature and nature's God. In other words, since God made this place, we should see characteristics of his nature as we look on the various aspects of creation. We see the hugeness of God and as we look at the universe. We see the orderliness as we see this giant ocean, but yet people put million dollar houses right on the edge of it because they know they can trust in the low tide and the high, high tide most of the time. <laughs> and Again, the power of God and a wave or a waterfall are the intricacy of God and looking at a little amoeba under a microscope. And Schaefer noted that everything's in three. Time, past, present, future. Even everything on the planet is in threes. Without threes, you have nothing. Not one, not two, not four, threes. He said, whoever God is, he's in three persons. And all of creation denotes that in everything that's made. And so he he wants us to know that in, in relating to God through his son, Jesus Christ, Jesus loves you. But also we're gonna have a relationship with the Father. And this, as you read through John, that was the whole point of Jesus. Jesus is everything I'm doing is to bring you to the Father. Everything I'm doing is you believing in me so you can receive the Father. Now, I've, through the years, where people have heard God as their Father and they had a very abusive, difficult home life, they find it very difficult in Christianity because their view of Father is such a heavy, negative thing and have to work through that to come to know the true nature of God and what a loving father he has. Most people today, according to the statistics, will not have a home with a healthy relationship with their father. When I was in going out ministering in the prison, I I say, when I was in prison for four years, my wife's like, you got to clarify that, Brian. (laughs) Yes, when I was a a chaplain in prison, over 80% of all prisoners never had a dad in the home. That's just crazy when you think the statistics. Well, I can tell you from being in the prison for four years that the other 20% may have had a dad in the home, but it was not a good relationship. And those of you who have had a good father, count yourself you know, as in a very, very selective class of people and be thankful but they can't trust the father. They're afraid of the father. It's, it's a negative thing because their dad was an alcoholic and when he came home, everybody hid, you know. But no, I, God the father, he loves us so much. And, and uh, I used to have a, a, a friend and I, I don't know, it bothered me a little bit, but also it, it enlightened me. But he, when he prayed, he would say, daddy, daddy, thank you for this food. Thank you for this food, Daddy. And I'm like, ah, oh, ah. Oh. But then I was with some friends in Connecticut, and they lived, they were not Jewish, they were Polish, but they lived in a Jewish community. And the kids would come over, and one day in particular, this little girl's like, can I stay longer? And he's like, yeah, call your dad. And she starts speaking Hebrew, and she starts saying, Abba, 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 but Abba, but, but you know, Abba, which is the word Daddy in Hebrew. And this is what the Bible says, our father, Abba, daddy. Your daddy loves you. (laughs) Your heavenly father loves you. Jesus, the son, loved you so much, he died for you on the cross. And God, Paul is saying that you're not in the tribulation. You didn't miss the rapture. You're not going to be condemned. God is not against you. He loves you. And the father loves you. Can you picture yourself jumping on, on the throne of God on the lap of your father and 
giving him a big hug and pulling on his beard and making a fish face with his lips and, 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 and loving your father. And there's Jesus forever now in resurrected human flesh, scars in his hands, scars in his brow, our brother forever, the Bible says, but he's also our husband to the church, our best friend, our savior, our Lord, our God. Can you also see a sweet fellowship with him? John says in 1 John, now some of you guys are jealous that you weren't one of the apostles walking around with Jesus in the first four verses of 1 John. But he said, let me tell you something. No. No. The sweetest fellowship we've ever had with Jesus was not when he was with us in human flesh. It's been with him in the spirit after he's ascended to heaven. And I want you to know that. That the joy that I'm experiencing right now is not because I knew Jesus in the flesh, but because I'm experiencing Jesus right now in the spirit that that joy would be made full in you as well. In 1 John 4.10, it says this, and this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So you might be saying, I need to love God more. I, I, I sinned and I made bad choices and it, and it dishonored God and it didn't show God that we loved him. You know what? The Bible makes it clear, especially 1 John Your focus is God loving you. And let his love for you overwhelm you until you respond in loving him. Until then, don't focus on your lack of love for God. We're in sinful bodies. We're in a sinful world. It's just up and down. We're in a roller coaster. But you focus on your on his love for you. But I'm struggling with sin. Focus on his love for you. But I'm really struggling. Focus on his mercy, his grace, his kindness, his death, his resurrection. He's our shepherd. He's our friend. He's our Lord and our Savior. Get your eyes on Jesus. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 9 through 11 now, repeating 10, but in context with 9 and 11. And this is love. God was manifested towards us that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Same author of John 3.16, right? Very similar. Another way of saying John 3.16. And then again in verse 10, and this is love. Not that we love God, but what? That he loved us, that he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Jesus taking your sins upon himself being beaten and bruised. Interesting, Hebrew says, the soul that sins shall surely die. But the same book of Hebrew tells us, Jesus was tempted in all points as where, but he never sinned. So how did he die? He goes on to tell us, you put him to death. Years ago, I was talking to a girl in Israel as everybody was shopping at the Hava factory. And she She's witnessing this young girl. She's a um, time she turned 18. She was a multimillionaire because of her portion of the kibbutz there. But she'd been around the world and just very empty. And she just said, you're a Christian. Let me ask you, did, do you blame the Jews for killing Jesus? I've had Italians think the same thing. And I've said, no, the Romans didn't kill Jesus. N- n- they can't. Jews couldn't kill Jesus. Nothing could kill Jesus. The only thing that killed Jesus was your and my sins. We are the ones that put Jesus to death. Now, they may have had a portion and hanging him on the cross, but it didn't kill him. My God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? To tell us, it is finished. And he gave up his spirit. Into your hands, Father, I give my spirit. In John 13, 34, it says that you... Love one another as I have loved you. Well, he's also given us everlasting comfort. Interesting, in 1 John, he's, he keeps talking about the end times and he ends by saying, or 1 Thessalonians, he ends by saying comfort one another with these words. As you think about the end times and even the tribulation period, be comforted. 
And here he's saying against them. Not only do you be comforted, but God through his love for you is giving you eternal comfort and good hope. The word hope in the Greek is a certain confidence, not like our English word. You have a confidence of his grace. Amen? Where our sin abounds, what happens? His grace abounds more. Through the grace of Christ, we are going to make it to heaven. And nobody's going to be walking through the pearly gates going, praise me, praise me. I was so holy. I was so righteous. I had just go to church attendance. And we're going to be going. It was grace and mercy and the kindness of God as a gift from him, not of our works. And now in verse 17, comfort your hearts. This grace that gives us confidence, comforts your hearts and establish, root, ground you in every good work and every good word and work. You see, if you got Christianity right, you never doubt that you're saved. It's a, it's a done deal. I will never perish. I will never, I will have everlasting life because God loves me and gave his son for me who already did 100% of the work, not of myself, not of works. But now that I'm free, I want to tell about Jesus. It's such good news. I want to love one another. I want to be kind and merciful. I want to be a light and a salt, not so I get to heaven, not because I need brownie points to make sure I get in. None of these things save me. But I just want to do it because I want everybody to know how much God loves them because it's changed my life. God's love for me is so great, and it's not just for me, but it's for everybody who believes. Every good word and every good work. Isn't that awesome? That we can speak for us the utterance of Christ. Paul says in Colossians 3.17 in a great way, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name or in the nature of our Lord Jesus Christ giving thanks to God the Father through him. So when you're driving on the freeway, think of, again, how would Jesus be driving right now if he were here? <laughs> you're going to a restaurant. What would it be like to go to Hoffs over here for lunch with Jesus? Do you think everybody would have a moment created through his nature, his kindness, you now have that power. So four things I want to focus on in conclusion here. Number one is God has delivered us from the coming tribulation period and we will be raptured out of here very, very soon. You ready? Number two, there are those who reject the gospel. They reject the love of the truth. But it's not you. You have not rejected the truth. There is no condemnation. You shall not perish. You believed. Number three, stand fast, stand firm. Continue to bear fruit through the power of the Holy Spirit and through the knowledge of God's word. You will have many rewards in heaven. And then finally, verse, the fourth thing is let us all rest in God's love for us. That's the gospel. The gospel isn't, God's a judge and he's decided not to condemn you. The gospel is God so loves you. That's news. God loves you. A Muslim can't go out and say to, to the world, God loves you. It's Allah condemns you until you become a Muslim. You've never heard a Jehovah Witness come to the door going, God loves you. The Hindus don't go out saying, God loves you. This is unique in Christianity. And he gave the greatest of all gifts, his only begotten son, to take your place on death row for eternity. Not a hundred year death row, but an eternal death. And so let us focus on his love for us. Thank you for this day, Lord, and thank you for this very difficult passage, not so easy to teach, but yet... At the same time, it's so significant for our growth and how to pray. Teach us to pray, Lord, as Paul, you taught Paul to pray, as you, by the Holy Spirit, wrote this very prayer for us to be able to pray for one another and give us great encouragement and hope. 
as we stand firm on your word, your truth, especially in the last days where it's becoming increasingly more and more impossible, and, and, uh, not as uh, popular to believe the truth and to speak the truth, but yet the myths, the lies that are tickling men's ears, that's the thing that's going to become the famous thing. But Lord, let us stand firm, not be moved away from the things written in the word, the eternal word that not one jot or tittle can pass away until all's been fulfilled. Right now with everybody's heart in this reverent moment, I know several visiting people here today and I know online there's people that catch us and maybe don't know the Lord. All you gotta do is trust in him. The Bible says if you don't say you're a sinner, then how can God help you? Because his whole purpose is to come and die for sins. So the truth can't be in you. And you make God to be a liar because the beginning of the gospel is God loves you, but you're a sinner. But he loves you so much, he wants to take care of that sin. Now believe in him. Lord, I believe in you. Jesus, I believe you were the satisfaction 100% of all my condemnation was placed upon you. All the wrath of God against sin, especially my sin, was laid upon you. All the wrath of God is no longer in play. It's all been spilt upon you and you died. The impossible thing, the sinless person died because my sins put you to death. But you rose again, conquering sin and death. And now not of myself, not of works, but as a gift from you I receive. And the gifts and the calling of God can never change. They're irrevocable. I receive that gift. Now, Lord, let me walk in your love. Let me live a life learning of your love for me. And hopefully the love of Christ will eventually pickle me and change me and constrain me that I try to love you as much as you love me. And I would love my fellow man as you have loved me. In Jesus' precious name. And everyone said... Amen, amen. God bless you. We've got donuts and coffee. We'd love to talk to you. Love to see what God spoke to your heart today through the message. Or if you need prayer, we'd love to pray for you. Make this a moment in time. We're not a movie theater. We don't run in and run out. We're here to connect. Some of the most important things of why we come to church rather than stream it from home is the connection that you have, meeting people, praying for them, then praying for you. Sharing, you know, iron sharpens iron, that we're sharpening one another as we share the principles and the truths of God's word. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. May you experience the grace of God that causes you to boldly come into his throne room. And may you be a light and a salt to the earth in these last moments of the last days before the coming of the Lord. Here, there, in the air. We'll see you soon. God bless. Bye-bye.